Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the show. And uh, some of you might have noticed a little bit of a difference this evening. In fact, actually, there's no one sat over there or there's no one sat over there. It's just me. Hey, look at that. I've got free reign this evening. I can do what I want. I can say what I want because Ian is away today. So anyway, welcome to the Open Door Show. My name is Richie Clapson. And as I say, no Ian Child this show, but rest assured, he'll be back on Saturday. Guys, it's great to have you here. And just in case this is your first time, and for some of you, I'm sure it is. I'm looking at the names on the list. I don't recognize all those names. Let me tell you what you've let yourself in for this evening. Our aim is, as always, to give you 45 minutes of non-stop positivity, uh, a bit of fun, and it's all set around the theme of property and, of course, business development, because all property is to do with business. Ian and I run a company called Property CEO, if you didn't guess, uh, which you probably would have done by now. And our day job is training people how to become successful small-scale property developers. And uh, you know, many people like the idea of developing property, but I often worry, you know, maybe it's a bit risky, maybe it's a bit complex, you know, but our job really here is to give people the support and the training they need to go and do it as safely as possible, mitigate those risks as much as possible. And right now, interestingly, there is an amazing opportunity out there. And to be fair, you know, I don't think this opportunity will come around again, certainly not in my lifetime, the combination of what's going on at the moment with the recession, but the finance still there, the government putting massive support in, particularly in our industry as well. As always, only for those to go and seek it out and uh, you know start rather than settle down and wait for things to happen. As always, we'll be serving up uh, advice, predictions, a guest this evening, uh, a bit of training, I guess, to go along with it, but above all, having fun. Please put your questions in chat box. As always, no questions, no show. And of course, uh, let's see who's on this evening. We've got a host of you on. So uh, Sarah's on, Dan, Hodjinda, Will, Debbie, Adir, Peter, Jackie, uh, Andrew, Nick, Michael, Yvonne, Dill, Ranjit, Chris, Trish, Roma, Dev, Sam, Richard, uh, Serene, and so I've not mentioned you all. There's quite a few names still I haven't mentioned. I do apologize if I have not mentioned your name. And Debs and Richard says, good evening, Richie, and to all listening in tonight's session from the sunny and warm South Coast. It's very polite, isn't it? And Ranjit, of course, Ranjit says, good evening, you lovely people. Ranjit Singh from Property Investor News. I don't know if we've mentioned that before, but Property Investor News is worth a read, uh, particularly because there's an article that I've written in there. So, uh, I mean, what better reason than to, to buy it, the fact that I'm on there. Now, Guys, just give us a quick hands up and let me know you can see and hear me, not Ian. Give us a quick hands up. Excellent. Excellent. Good stuff. That's good. Now, of course, you know, the other thing as well, please put in the chat box. If you prefer the show without Ian, and even if you don't, put it in the chat box and let me know. He's not here today, so we can do whatever we want. So please add it in the chat box if you think it's a much better show without him. I'll break it to him gently before Saturday. But please let me know in the chat box because um, it's always useful to know these things. And anyway, Clive just joins and Anthony just joined. So welcome. So we have a guest this evening. And as always, you know, we try and build this guest up. We we try and make them feel special. And I'm going to try and do the same this evening. And it comes back to, to funding. You wanted us to bring a development funder along. And uh, I thought, well, who could we bring? And, I, and uh, Ian and I had a long, long chat. And to be fair, um, I bumped into this fella um, in a pub because the pubs are recently opened and I, and I had a point with this guy and I thought well, he seems a reasonable fella. He seems to know a little bit about funding. So I thought, well, why not get him on? So here we go. Uh, we've got a funder on this evening. His name is Will Lucy. A lot of you will know Will. Uh, those that don't, you're about to meet him. So Will Lucy from Luck Capital is our special guest this evening. So it's the Will and Richie show this evening. So Will, are you there? Can you hear me? Will, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Good stuff. Can you turn your camera on for me, Will? See if we can see him as well. Yes. Excellent. Good stuff. Good evening. Yeah, Move your camera around. Come Good on, evening, let's get... You're looking very posh this evening with that facial hair going on. <laughs> posh is one way of happening. Yeah, I've had lots of other comments. It's been 50 50, to be honest, about whether it's a good or bad. Okay, well, well, I think it's here to stay. You know, I do think it's here to stay for a Well, I think you're a good-looking fella. I think you can pull it off. So I think that's great. Now, first of all, give me a hands up if you can actually see and hear Will as well, please. Yes, they can. They can all see and hear you. 
Uh, Ranjit says, no, Ian, no A-team. Ranjit Singh from Property Investor News. Oh, uh, uh, Ranjit, we've got to gang up on him. He's not here. Uh, let's uh, yeah, see. Uh, we've made lots of jokes about him. Say again, Will. Uh, while he's not here, we can make loads of jokes about him and, and, and with no no comeback. Well, I think we can. I mean, to be fair, I mean, the fellow went out, yeah. he went out and had his hair cut the other day, and he didn't look any different when he came back in. He still looked like he'd been dragged for a head backwards. So, you know, he needs to put a lot more effort in, and that's that's all I'm saying. Right, Will, do you want to uh, tell people, those that don't know, and of course those that do, you can refresh their memory, a little bit about who you are, what you do, what your company is, and what you're about? I certainly will, thank you. So, so yeah, so I've been introduced, obviously I'm William Lucy. Um, I've got a brokerage called Luck Capital, and, and we specialise in bridging and development finance, refurbishment finance, uh, development exit, all of the above, commercial conversions, you know, that's really our speciality. Now, you know, why do I do that? And that is always a good question. Um, I really started my journey as an accountant um, in various different industries. I obviously found my way into property. Uh, that was about 12 years ago. Uh, carried on working my work, working hard. Um, found my way in a couple of finance director roles. Um, and in those roles, I was also responsible for funding. I was responsible for raising finance, uh, looking after cash flow in those companies. Um, and particularly in the second finance director role, I was probably starting to raise more funding uh, and deal with more funding lines, etc. than I was actually doing accountancy. So um, you can see, I really enjoyed that side of it, and I saw an opportunity to to do what I thought would be an outstanding job at it. Um, knowing I was a numbers man, uh, I care about the detail, and I felt like I could do a good job, which is always how business starts. Um, so that, that was three years ago. Well, guys, um, uh, Will has left. I have just dismissed Will because he was going in and out and in and out. So uh, I do apologize for that. So um, it's a great start to the show, isn't it, on a, on a Tuesday evening? So what I'm going to suggest, um, why don't we we turn this into ask me any question you want. Uh, as always, you guys respond and you put your questions in. I see there was a question from Trish already. I'll pick that one up. Uh, we don't want to sit and listen to, to Will all shaky in that for another 10, 15 minutes and waste time doing that. So we get Will on uh, another time. So please, any questions you've got, put them in the chat box. Anything about development, you know, what's coming up, where the opportunities are at the moment. Uh, what's our thoughts on the sort of planning uh, white paper that's coming out? When's a good time to buy? Absolutely anything you want, guys. Uh, please put that in there. Let's see what we can do to make this a good show. And for those that have just joined us, I do apologize. Uh, we've obviously got some signal problems this evening uh, with Will Lucy, and we're not able to connect to him. So rather go backwards and forwards, I turn that off. So I'm going to come back to Trish's question, and then we'll see what other questions uh, come into the chat box as we go through. So Trish said, uh, I've had a limited company. Uh, are there any negative implications to changing the name and structuring this as a holding company, then an SPV for each project? My accountant advised me to speak to a broker as uh, this could cause problems. Well, Trish, you can't speak to a broker because his internet's broken. Um, so, uh, you know, he needs to get that one sorted. That's for sure. Mark Leck said, uh, or someone said, you know, who's his internet provider? We've got to get that sorted. Now, I think Trish here in simple terms, it's all about the history of the company. That's what you've got to be cautious of, okay? So if you've got a company, you said you have a limited company, has it traded? If it has done any form of trading at all, then you don't want to use it as an SPV because the funders won't like that. They like a clean and simple company, okay? They're not interested in something that may have some history or some other implications because ultimately they've got stepping rights. They need this ability to step in and take over should you not perform, should you cause a problem. And that's part of, of what you give them the ability to do. Now, of course, them stepping in and doing that is, is absolutely the last resort. But what they don't want to do is come in and inherit maybe a tax problem or some other issue. So certainly it's unlikely it's better be done for an SPV unless it's completely clean. Uh, for a group holding company, potentially, okay? So you need to have a chat with your accountant, make sure the coding and everything is fine. But you said uh, structuring and using this as a holding company, then an SPV. Um, you, 
you, your holding company can't then turn into your SPV. And your special purpose vehicle, which is what SPV stands for, is just a limited company for those that don't know. And so what you're really wanting to do is have a holding company up here. OK, that's a limited company that holds the shares in the individual SPVs for the projects. So they can't be one of the same. I don't think you're asking that, but that's I'm just reading what's on the screen there. So the individual SPVs are going to be individual limited companies. And generally, the holding company would hold the shares for that. But as I say, if there's any any action or anything that's gone on in those SPVs uh, in their previous guys, you don't want it going forward. Now, by all means, uh, reach out to Will. Um, I'm not able to ask him what his contact details are, but if you want to listen to uh, to the uh, on the, or the replay on YouTube, we'll put Will's contact details in there, and you can pick those up and connect with him at any time. So, Trish, hopefully that has answered your question. Um, Will Lucy's put in, he says, apologies, I'm not sure why the signal was bad and I've never had an issue thus far. Check the Wi-Fi and it all looks good. Well, here we go. Um, anyway, let's carry on as we are and we'll get Will back at another day so we give it we give it the full value rather than getting cut in, in and out. So Julian's question. So Julian, good evening to you. Julian says, um, question for Richie, which is good that the question's for me, Julian, because Will's not here. So I'm pleased you said that. Given all that we know about the recession, new changes to planning legislation etc what is the ideal time for us to oh, hang on a minute my screen's popping up and down here you're putting questions in like mad you guys what is the ideal time for us property ceos to start making offers on schemes now next six months next 12 months not now um and it probably won't be as long as six months uh, julian so i think at the moment and you know guys and this is with people that are in a position one thing i mean julian is, is has been on the program with us and uh you know he's trained he's educated he knows what to go and do be very cautious don't just jump into development i know we're upbeat and we talk about positivity and so on but uh you can make a lot of money in development and equally you can lose a lot of money so just proceed with a bit of caution if you're not educated and you don't understand the process but really in terms of when that time is to make an offer i think it's probably going to be in the next three months that's probably when this the, the things start moving and why do i say that well it all comes back uh, largely to what in my opinion what's going to start happening uh with the unemployment levels and that's probably going to be the result of the furlough scheme getting retracted and getting pulled out so we know that that was stopped it was stopped last month you know no one else was taken on that and we know that that finishes okay i think it's october but what's actually happening is as we go forward the furlough scheme level because they were up to i think it was 80 percent of whatever of the wages was being pulled back and so august and september that is being pulled back so what's happening and you've seen these announcements on the news recently julian and indeed everyone else that the, the, that the companies are now making those decisions. You know, John Lewis were on the other week. Uh, Subway were on the, the, the sandwich people. Uh, Boots were on, weren't they? Making these announcements that they're now going to actually make quite significant redundancies. Now, up to now, they haven't had to do that because they've had the full backing of the government. And why wouldn't you, you know, basically keep all these employees on standby just in case? Because going back a few months, no one knew what was going to happen. No one knew the extent of the problem. And they didn't know how long we were going to be before we could get back out on the streets and so on and so forth. Well, we've got a bit more understanding, although there are still a lot of uncertainties. But one thing is for sure is that the furlough scheme, the big government support is getting pulled out. Companies will now no longer be able to support all of those staff. So what you're going to start seeing is companies now making decisions and having to offload staff. What will that mean? Uh, they're probably going to be shutting branches, as indeed some of the retailers we talked about are, or they're going to be shutting offices or whatever, or closing down completely, unfortunately. Now, as sad as that is, that is going to mean that there's going to be opportunities. And what you're going to start to see coming to the market is more perhaps retail and office opportunities and maybe industrial. But if we focus on the sort of retail and office, I think there are gonna be some big influx of those. And indeed, chatting to a few students, uh, I think it was last week, one of those actually said they were monitoring within their area the amount of retail opportunities because they're interested to get into what they think is gonna be a big boom in retail development or redevelopment. And uh, they said that there has been a significant increase in retail opportunities coming to the market. Not all that, that would suit them at this stage. They said they were down at the sort of smaller end of the market, you know, the sort of 
I don't know, sort of takeaway shop type size units, um, but they were looking for some more interesting stuff coming their way. So I think, Julian, I think it's going to probably be starting, in my opinion, you know, we get through August, September, October, you're going to start to see these opportunities. How long they last, um, you know, we don't know. Uh, everyone at the moment has predicted that we will have uh, an upturn and be back to today's levels, if you like, in terms of gross development values uh, in the first quarter of 2022. Now, whether that is still the case or not, I don't know. If that is the case, that will mean if you tried to plot that curve and look at that curve, Julian, you'd see that actually, you know, in 12 months time, we'd be rising back up. So the opportunity to get the cracking deals uh, may, may have somewhat passed. There's still going to be opportunities out there. And of course, you know, the time could go on a bit longer. Now, in terms of making that offer, you know, you haven't seen the influx at the moment. I think you're going to in the next few months. Then look at your numbers, make sure you've got a solid 20% profit on your deal and then consider offering at that point. Hopefully, Julian, that has answered that question. OK, let's see who we've got next. Um, uh, Nick says, Nick's on this evening. Nick says, my understanding is HMRC don't like people setting up and then closing separate SPVs per project because of entrepreneurs relief, i.e. tax avoidance. Is that correct? Um, well, possibly so, Nick. Uh, I, I think that there's nothing wrong with that in terms of how you set it up. I mean, tax avoidance, yeah, sure, that you can't be going down, you know, the, the, the road of, of dodging your tax or something, because you will get caught out. There is nothing legally wrong with setting up an SPV um, for a business. Obviously, you know, you talk about entrepreneurs relief, you need to best check with your accountant how that all stacks up, what other businesses you've got, what other implications there are there. But actually, the principle of setting up SPVs has got no issues at all with that, providing they're all structured properly, they're owned properly, whether that's you or whether you've got a group holding company owning that, then I see no issue with that at all. Um, you know, it's just a limited company that you set up for a period of time. You may well keep it. It might be if you're going to build these properties to hold, uh, then you may well keep the freehold in the SPV and have that long term refinance your way out of it. So, you know, it's just another limited company. And there's a lot of businesses will set up limited companies to do all sorts of things. And bear in mind, you know, you're going to set up a company for development that's probably going to last, you know, maybe one or two years. Well, uh, I mean, look at the stats for companies. Many companies don't last more than three years. So it, it's nothing untoward in terms of what you're doing here. Um, now, what we always say for everyone is take proper accountancy advice with what else you've got going on. You know, if you've got a whole portfolio out there, a buy to let, um, maybe you've got some other businesses over there. How does all that integrate together? You need to get the best set up for you. And as, as Nick's talking about here about entrepreneurial relief, what else is there that you can do? We have a fairly complex uh, structure here in, in Property CO of, of how that's owned because Ian and I have been in the past doing other things. So you need to make sure you've got that right and it is pretty much bespoke for everyone. So, yes, you want to minimize your tax payments. Uh, you certainly can't avoid them when it's due. And uh, we would always say, you know, it's never worth it. Don't get involved in. Uh, crazy schemes of you know investing in this or that or little scams or loopholes because they'll all come out and catch you out. Do it nice and straightforward. And traditionally, the route here is SPV. So I don't see any problem with that. Hopefully, Nick, that has answered that question. OK, let's see what else we've got here. Brilliant answer, says Julian. Edward says, sorry, I'm late. And guys, for those that's just joining uh, late and uh, Edward being one of those, uh, Karen looks like she's just joined us. Emma, I can't remember if you were on by then. We were planning to have Will Lucy on this evening. We had some technical problems. Well, we didn't, but Will did. And for some unknown reason, he's never had it to date, but his, uh, his internet played up. So uh, we had to sort of close that down with Will. So it's me taking questions. And Ian's on uh, away this week. And uh, so he'll be back on Saturday. So uh, just me this evening. So please, uh, please put your questions in. Yvonne, good evening, Yvonne. I trust you are well. She says, do you think the stamp duty change will be uh, of benefit to developers? Um, uh, in, in Right now, yes, potentially. So it depends where you are. So the stamp duty change, which is, uh, you know, through to March, I think it is next year, where up to £500,000, they've, they've, they've abolished the stamp duty, I think in, in simple terms, um, is OK for now. But of course, this is only to March next year. So if we're talking here, you know, we're talking uh, with Julian earlier about um, buying, you know, some sites, making an offer on sites. 
and then developing them out, well, you'll be talking 18 to 24 months. Even if you bought something tomorrow, you know, the likelihood is you're not putting that into the market to back end of 21, maybe 2022. On that basis, the March 21 uh, stamp duty, uh, you, you know, abolishment has gone. So there's no benefit uh, to, to us in, in, in terms of that respect. Um, now, if you've got a development out on site at the moment and you've got properties that will fall into that category, um, because, you know, below certain levels, if you're building very basic cheap flats, there's, there's hardly any implication, hundreds of pounds, if, if that in some cases. Um, but if you've got some other properties, maybe two or three bed houses that are out there selling, that is probably going to put some momentum into purchasing right now. So I think it's quite exciting for developers, Yvonne, that's got stuff on site, is going to get that little bit of momentum and help them moving. Now, one thing it will do for a short period it will stimulate the market because once people start buying, things start happening, people start moving, money gets spent. So it does stimulate the market, it does stimulate the economy. This is why the government are trying to do it. I think um, you could argue that uh, maybe it has a negative effect on us developers because if it stimulates the market, um, people might be holding out for their commercial properties to get a, to get a better deal. Then if it's doom and gloom, then you know they're open to really cracking deals. So there's plus and minus on, on it. I mean, I don't think anything that stimulates the whole economy is bad, but um, as a developer, you know, we, you're, if you're looking for the best time to buy, the best opportunities is when everyone else is doom and gloom, and you're trying to buy, a, let's call it a product for argument's sake, a product which no one else wants, and they're trying to offload and get money in their pocket. So. Hopefully, Yvonne, that uh, that gives you a little bit of an overview. Um, good stuff. OK, uh, that, that, uh, Edward says uh, Will must have known it was just just me out there tonight. He did know, Edward. That's a bit harsh. No, he already knew it was just me. And that's actually why he wanted to come on the show. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't just because um, because Ian's not here. Uh, Yvonne says, thank you. That's good. No problem at all. OK, let's have a look. Um, I've got some other questions here. So Adam, so Adam's put a question in. Adam says, uh, I think I want to start in property development. Well, good, good choice, Adam. But don't really know if it's for me. What should be my first steps? Should I try buy to lets? I currently own and run my own business in distribution, and I do have free time and some funds to invest. OK, so uh, interesting bag there of questions. So Adam basically wants to think about getting into property development. Um, doesn't know if it's for him. Uh, should he start in buy to lets? Uh, and he's got some money. I think, Adam, you've got, you've got to decide what you want. OK, what is it you want out of out of this? You know, you said you've got a business in distribution. Are you going to keep that going? Is, is that something you want to close down? Uh, are you just looking for uh, you know a long term investment strategy? Are you looking for a little bit of extra income? Are you looking for something to do? Are you looking for somewhere to deploy your funds? So I think you've got to start answering some of those questions. And what you want to have a look at is what the different options give you. Now, there is a, a myriad of things you can go and do in, in property. So you can do some buy to lets. You can do some HMOs, which are house, houses of multiple occupation, if you, if you weren't aware, Adam. You could go and do some service departments. You could do something called rent to rent, where you sort of do a guaranteed rent and let, let the rooms out individually, make more money that way. So there's lots of different things you can do. Now. If you're looking to uh, build a monthly income uh, over a longer term, then buy to lets might well do that for you. But typically, most buy to lets are not going to yield you a huge amount of money individually. In, in some areas of the country, you know, a couple of hundred quid per buy to let once you've got a mortgage and so on and so paid off uh, or, or being paid off. So, you know, you might want to think about that. So buy to let strategy can work very well, but you've often got to grow that reasonable size and over a longer period. Uh, if you want to replace your income or leave your job or close uh, your distribution business down, as you, as you mentioned here. I think HMOs and the service departments will bring you more income, but potentially, unless you get them managed out, uh, and even then, they will inevitably cause you more work. So you say you've got some free time, as you say in the question, but, but how much free time have you actually got? Then if you move up to development, uh, we're in a position there and, and really, we're not, I mean, we don't talk too much about buy to lets and HMOs. We're not specialists in that by any any means. So I'd suggest Adam explore those avenues with other people that will perhaps know more about that and give you 
some sort of real serious numbers and ideas of what you can do. But if we then look at development, development really is, um, you know, it's not a get rich quick scheme. In fact, none of this is, although rent to rent, you can start relatively quickly and start earning some money. Development is, is really a longer game, Adam, that you might want to get into. OK, you could run it alongside your distribution business. I don't know what, what time you have spare, but typically it is possible to be earning you know, a six figure sum, one to two hundred thousand pound a year out of a, a development business where you're only working two or three days a week on average. It's going to have peaks and troughs as you go through various stages. But once you get educated, you could go and do that. If you think that could fit alongside your distribution business, then there are two quite healthy businesses, maybe in, in completely different spectrums for you to you know, distribute your risk, if you like, mitigate your risks in business overall and, and get involved in. And typically you could be going to do what we talk about, which is small scale development, where you can go and turn over projects where you might be earning 100, 200, maybe 250, 300,000 pounds a year. And you know that is reasonably big lumps of money. You're not going to earn that that quickly. It's going to take you probably 18 to 24 months to get your first deal over the line. Assuming you got educated, started getting educated tomorrow, we take six months to educate someone, and 18 months is probably the minimum for your deal. So, Adam, it probably take you two years to get that sort of lump of money. Okay. Now, we just talked earlier when we were talking to to Julian about when a good time is to offer. Well, it's a crack in time now if this is your bag, if development is your bag. So I would definitely think it's worth considering. One thing I would say to you, uh, don't believe the myth that you have to start in buy to let and then work your way out to HMOs and service departments. And if you're really good, you can go and do the, the great big strategy of development. And there's a lot of that sort of commentary out there in the industry. And uh, it's a lot of old BS to be fair. Um, for some people it works, Adam. For some people, they wanna <clears throat> cut their teeth and they wanna understand just maybe venturing into the property industry but the reality is what you learn doing buy to lets isn't necessarily applicable in fact it's almost it's almost creating bad habits i might say in learning development development the way we teach development is much more leveraged it's much more about being the ceo hence the name of the company of a development company okay and it's working at a higher level by to let you're often working much more at the cold face. So we often have to undo when we bring people on our program, undo their bad habits to get them going forward into development. So if if it's for you to start at that that lower level effectively, that's great. If it's not for you, don't start there. Go straight into development if you think that's what you want to do. Adam, hopefully that's answered that question. Uh, Colin, Colin says, so good evening, Colin. Guys, thanks for firing these questions in on the last minute with Will Lucy disappearing on us. Uh, Colin uh, says, what do you think is a good first project for a new developer? Uh, well, coincidentally, very similar to what we've just discussed there with Adam about getting into it. Um, Colin, the first scheme I would say you want to get into is permitted developments, okay? Um, do not go for something that needs to have planning you are going to go down a long road and cause yourself issues, okay? Uh, the planning system in this country, Colin, is, is broken. It, it is, it's not very good, okay? There are lots of issues with it. It's going to be even worse now all the planning officers have been on, well, I don't know if they've been on furlough, but they've certainly been working at home uh, very inefficiently. So there'll be a lot of backlog. So going into a project that needs planning is certainly not advisable. Going in to do land assembly and that sort of thing, in our opinion, is definitely not advisable for your first project. It takes a long time to get through. And I always say it's a bit like going into a boxing match with one arm tied behind your back, letting the planning officer, the local authority take control. You don't want that. It can take you a year or two years to get through that. Go down the road of permitted developments. So Colin, you, you, you know, you might not know what permitted developments is, but it's basically in simple terms, it's just the time I've got available tonight. It's the right for you to go and do certain things without, in some cases, any need to even tell the local authority, in others, just to actually notify them and satisfy maybe a few simple rules. So there can be what's called a prior notification. So you have to submit uh, an application, but it's a, there is a sort of an automated process in broad terms. If you don't get a response in 56 days, you've got an automatic approval. Now, don't take that as carte blanche that's as simple as that there are a few complications around it but if you go down this road of permitted development um, and in whatever area um, then you are almost certainly going to be able to 
get your first project up and running a lot easier and you're going to have less troubles along the way there's always development is not easy okay it is difficult but it's going to be a lot easier if you go down the permitted development route i can tell you that and what sector going back to what i said to julian earlier colin um offices more office opportunities come into the market and i don't mean just converting to residential and more retail opportunities and there are permitted development rights around both of those areas at the moment okay um so uh, raj just put a question in uh, raj says uh, i'm not sure if this is uh, this is uh, uh, it's not the raj from property investor news i thought it was this is different raj sorry two rajs raj says good evening half a team <laughs> And, and, and Raj, is it the better half or, or not? Um, I'll let you guys make your mind up. Uh, if you have a if you have a fifteen, and I, obviously I won't, I will tell Ian that, that that he wasn't missed. If you have a fifteen month development loan, and there is another spike in COVID, and your area is locked down, and everything comes to a halt, should you be breaking into a cold sweat? Uh, would the funding companies be helpful, or are you in a, in a creek without a paddle? Um, potentially you you might want to break into a cold sweat um try and catch a flight to a foreign country where they can't find you and start drinking heavily um but possibly none of those things would be possible if there's another spike so maybe just the cold sweat now so raj yes in principle that could be a problem okay but let's 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 be honest with this this is like um i mean i've done a lot of uh, non executive businesses over the years and I've done a lot of uh, business turnarounds and recoveries and help businesses out. And one of the things always is communication. We talk about four key skills that are so essential for you to get into development. And the number one skill is people skills. It's the ability to communicate with people, okay? Now, if, if the proverbial was hitting the fan and you know there's another spike and you're in the middle of it and you haven't sold and you need to extend your terms, okay? Now, You've got to go and talk to them. You've got to go and talk to the funders. Now, the funders, the funders are not developers. Okay, let's make it's absolutely clear they don't want the keys back. Okay. Now, if you went to uh, let's get another analogy, like a car finance company, and you couldn't pay your finance, they'll come and repossess the car because that's quite easy. They just they just repossess it. They throw it into an auction. They get rid of it. It's a fairly easy product to get rid of and it's normally worth whatever it's worth okay at an auction doesn't matter if it's a bit dirty the service history is there or whatever it just goes through development is very different you imagine raj a half finished development okay uh, and the funders have got to come in and and pick that up it's not easy just to appoint an auctioneer and say get a shot of this i mean they can they can do that but the value they may retain on a part finished product is is could be significantly down act in a professional manner so they can't just steamroller in i mean there are certain parts of this industry that aren't controlled it's, it's not regulated in certain areas it's often unregulated finance but you know pe pe people have got to do things properly now what i would say in any situation and this is this this is refers to anyone who's involved in any business if you owe someone money and you can't pay it back which is simply is what this would be you can't sell maybe the properties uh, the finance is term, you know, the, the term is finished and you can't pay them back. Talk to them and tell them what your proposals are. The worst thing is, is if you put your head in the sand. And a lot of business owners have done this over the years. And then they're going to get the full weight of whoever, whoever is owed that money straight down on them. And, and, and fair enough. If you actually stand up and I've dealt with companies in the past, I've tried to help them. and say, look, let's just ring up. Who, who do you owe this money to? And you ring them up and you just say, look, and I've done this on behalf of business directors before. I said, look, I'm working with these guys as a non-exec advisor. Um, they, they, they've got no money. The business is in trouble, but they've got a plan. And can I talk to you about it? And can we come and see you? And most, most people go, yeah, of course you can. Come and have a chat. Because all people want to do is get through it. Okay. The last thing that a funder wants to do is come and repossess your site and take it off you. So you want to be in there discussing and negotiating with them. And then they, they might charge you a little bit of a premium. They might charge you an extra percentage on the rate. But if you can get through it and work together, that is the best scenario. But coming back to that, Raj, at the beginning, you want to see in the small print what, what the detail is for extending. OK, what can or can't you do? 
and if necessary have a bit more time on it okay so it's not necessarily a big deal at this stage to say i want a little bit of conservatism on this i want a bit of coverage can i extend not for 15 months can i make this a 24 month development deal now in some cases you may pay a little premium for that in most cases you won't you'll only pay if you borrow that money over a longer period but you've got a longer backstop on it so always build yourself in a bit of time or look at the T's and C's, look at the small print, get your solicitors to look at it, knowing what could happen. So first and foremost, try and head it off at the past, get yourself some flexibility in there. If you're in it, and this applies to anyone, if anyone's in this right now, just pick up the phone. Don't necessarily go through your solicitor, just pick up the phone, have a chat with someone seen at the funders and, and see what you can do. Have a plan, even if it is, look, we're trying to refinance these, we're, we're going to have to sell them off cheaper. We're going to end up, you know, on, on a negative position. But I've got some other assets and whatever. Just come up with a plan. You know, if you're going to pay someone £100 a week to pay them off, potentially that will, will satisfy. So keep the dialogue going. Keep keep chatting. Uh, Raj, hopefully that is helpful. Um, OK. Uh, so we've got a question in from Anne. Uh, so Anne says, what qualifies the development of a residential to HMO being a commercial valuation? Is it about the ease of it being, is it about the ease of it being a residential? Okay, and I'm not an HMO specialist. So um, uh, take what I say with a little bit of caution and probably go and speak to some valuers. But what I understand in terms of commercial valuations from HMOs, and, and this is just, this is really just me listening to other people. I don't own any HMOs. I don't advise on any HMOs, but just to give you an opinion, if you've got to get a commercial valuation, it's got to be occupied. OK, so someone's going to look at there's two valuations. There's a bricks and mortar valuation of that building. What's that worth as a house? Albeit it could be six bedrooms with six en suites, but it has a bricks and mortar valuation. And the second thing, it has a business valuation or what one might call a commercial valuation. And that really is what is the turnover of this business? What's the profitability of this business if someone was going to buy it as a business? And when we value businesses, we value them. There's lots of discussion about whether they're valued. I mean, ultimately, a business is worth what everyone's prepared to pay for it. But there are some stats and they often talk about a three to five multiplier of profits for a business. People often talk about, well, it, turnover is, is, you know, multiplier turnover. I don't agree with that in business. So I think in a, an HMO valuation, you'll be looking at a similar position. You're going to occupy it. It functions as a business. What are the books of that business tell me? And what's that worth as a business if I want to take it over? What I'm going to be looking at, though, I would expect at this time, because it would be no different to a hotel type business, is what's your occupancy rates? What sort of voyage have you got? You might be 100 percent full at the moment, but what have you been in the past and what are you likely to do in the future? That's how I would expect it to be done. And I know that's just a quick answer. As I say, I'm not an HMO expert, so maybe someone else would be able to uh, answer that a little bit easier for you. Um, uh, Raj, uh, when I was talking to Raj about the 15 month thing, he says, Richie, thank you for installing the confidence. I've heard horrendous stories. The sweat is gone. Raj, I'm pleased the sweat has gone. But I say, you've got to keep talking. And again, it's asking those questions at the beginning, because if you don't answer them at the beginning, get that flushed out. There are some funders who are who are not that helpful. I mean, I can tell you, we don't do a huge amount of development here, but we've got two schemes on the go, two funders. I mean, they're, they're fine, but one is a little bit more stony faced. Um, it's OK. They're OK to deal with. One is super friendly. Um, and we both had to extend both those deals in this period. One of them has been super friendly, couldn't do enough to help. The other one is a little bit more formal. And you just know that they you just got to treat them a little bit more difficult, uh, a little bit more different. They're, they're a little bit more difficult to deal with. You've got to have the right forms. It's all going to be filled in right. And they're not going to they're not going to let you get away with a lot. They're going to charge you for whatever they want to charge you. So um, anyway, hopefully that has good. Let me just make sure there's a whole stack coming in here. See what I have missed here. OK. Um, OK, Sam has asked one. Uh, so uh, following on from the other Saturday's brilliant show, uh, please can you explain how asbestos is removed and whether it impacts what other activities take place on site? Well, so that was a few weeks back, actually, Sam. So well remembered. Guys, if you haven't seen that show, uh, we had um, we, we, we had uh, Alec on, Alec Smith on from Arsan Surveyors. 
And Alec was talking to us all about asbestos. He's going to come back in the on, on the show again and talk about more about contamination. Uh, so go back and listen to that on YouTube if you are interested. But Sam, as far as you're concerned in terms of how asbestos is removed and the impacts, well, it depends. And you might remember on that show uh, uh, that Alec talked about the different types of asbestos. And without getting into detail, you know, there's some there's some pretty rotten stuff and there's not so bad stuff. The sort of cement board stuff is generally relatively easy to remove. In some instances, no license required. OK, so certain contractors in some instances can literally take off a uh, cement board, damp it down. It's a bit of a process they go through. So don't take this as your working instructions, uh, Sam. But they can damp it down, double bag it and get it collected by a specialist and get it taken away. OK, there are some asbestos that certain members of the public, you know, if you're a member of the public, you can just do it with yourself. And there are some control tips around this country that will accept it. If you turn up and you hatch back and unload it, they'll, they'll take it. Now, going on beyond that, there is stuff then which is notifiable. And the notifiable stuff often needs certain procedures, to, depending on the extent of what it is. If you remember how it was talking about it, it's, asbestos is not the problem. It's when it breaks down and the fibers get released into the atmosphere. That's a problem. And it's the lagging, which is a problem. That's me lagging a pipe, by the way. I don't, you're not just what anyway. It, pipe lagging is, is a bit of an issue because it's like this soft woven lagging, which goes around the old piping. And, and you'd get that in a lot of buildings from the sort of 50s and 60s. And that stuff, you can't you can't take it away without the whole thing crumbling and all the fibers getting released. Now, I had a project once where where that was on. That's actually the time I some people know for my sins. I owned a construction company for a period of time and we had uh, asbestos on a project uh, here in Hampshire. And it was very, uh, very intense stuff. And basically the whole the whole site had to be sealed. It was um, a, a big, a big residential property that we were we were refurbishing, extending. And basically the whole house had to be sealed up. All the windows were sealed up with plastic. Uh, there was a big vacuum door put on on the front and on the back. And then they wheeled in uh, the sort of clean unit and all the guys turned up in their suits. Uh, well, they went in one end in their civvies and they come out the other end of this unit, all in the white suits and the mask, a bit like a COVID outfit. Went in, pulled all the asbestos out, sealed, vacuumed everything up, you know, bagged it all, went back through the unit, et cetera, et cetera, took the whole thing down. And I think we're out of action on that site for at least a week and quite a few thousand pounds. So, you know, it depends, uh, Sam, on what extent, what caliber of asbestos this is, of how it's going to impact on your site. So in that instance, yes, we couldn't work on the site full stop. Now, we've had a, 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 another site about two years ago where we had some asbestos boarding. And the consultant looked at it and said, look, it's not a major issue. And in that case, they just let us seal off part of that site, providing it was damped down. The asbestos company came in. They just removed the paneling locally, bagged it, double bagged it, et cetera, took it away to a control tip. Um, you say often you have to notify the HSE and, and they may or they can choose if they want to come and inspect. But in that case, we're able to get on with probably 80 percent of the site. So it really does depend on where you're at. OK, guys, look, it's just gone quarter two. I apologize uh, profusely that we didn't have Will Lucy on the on this evening. Um, uh, I feel sorry for Will because, uh, you know, he was looking forward to coming on. I was certainly looking forward to uh, to getting him on this evening. So we'll have to bring him on uh, another time. Hopefully you have found that useful this evening. Now, um, just a quick announcement for you. Obviously, Ian is going to be back on Saturday. So hands up. Give me a hands up. It, despite all the technical problems, if you've enjoyed tonight's show, give us a quick hands up. Yes, I can see you have. And it looks like Jay. I didn't see Jay's joined us right at the end there. Jay, by the way, Will Lucy wasn't on. We had technical problems. Guys, thanks for putting your hands up. I will tell Ian that was the hands up that was actually saying it was a better show without him. But um I see if he gets a little bit upset, I'll, I'll hold back a little bit. I don't want to get the guy upset really too much for Saturday. So, guys, um, I'm afraid that's going to be it for today's show. But Saturday's show, we are back. It's myself and Ian. And you want to definitely come along on Saturday because it's going to be the last show before a summer break. We always take August off here, Property CEO. So we tend to take August off, have a bit of free time with the families. And so our last open door show before the summer break is going to be on Saturday. So myself and Ian, so build up some good questions. Let's go out with a bit of a bang before before a summer break. Gives you all a bit of time off, gives you a Tuesday evening and a Saturday morning off then for uh, for the whole of the month. So that can't be bad. So please come and do join us on Saturday. 
And of course, if you've got friends, uh, please invite them as always. Please share us on social media. Our closed Facebook group is Business Owners Creating Wealth Through Property Development. By all means, come and join us on that. And of course, give me, as always, please just put a little note in. If you've enjoyed tonight's show, despite all the problems, that would be much appreciated. And let's just see. Um, yeah, Nick says, hi, again. I love listening to you guys, or, or Guy, as it is this evening, particularly when walking the dog. Can you put your Tuesday and Thursdays open door sessions as podcasts, please? Um, well, they are on YouTube, uh, Nick, so you can go and listen to them on YouTube. You can just download them on YouTube, and you can listen to them while you're walking the dogs to your heart's content. If you haven't got a dog, anyone, go and borrow someone else's dog, and you can go and walk it. Trish says, thank you very much. Great webinar. Cannot wait to hear Ian's comments on Saturday Rear Audio. Yeah, he could have a right laugh about the Will Lucy thing. He's going to blame me, by the way, but I'm going to blame Will Lucy fair and squarely. Sorry, Will, if you're out there listening. And Jay says, a uh, much better show. Jay, thank you very much. Much better without Will or without Ian. I'm going to assume it's without Ian because uh, Will was our special guest. Very impressive on your own, says Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, says Anne. Uh, brilliant again, says Raj. Great show, even though it was either it was only you, says Yvonne. Gracias, says Michael. I feel some major banter between you two coming on, says Trish. Thanks. Good stuff, says Nick. And uh, please don't make Ian cry, says Raj. Guys, thanks for bearing with us. Hope you've enjoyed the show. And I'll see you back with the other half of Property CEO, Mr. Ian Child, on Saturday. Have a good few days and see you later. Bye-bye.